Okay, great. So first of all, uh, so the title is, is really related to the primary experiment that I wanna talk about today, which is um, how you gauge propellant in uh, tanks in microgravity. And that turns out to be a sort of an unsolved challenge that's been um, persisting now for at least the last 50 plus years since Neil Armstrong uh, landed the, uh, the LEM on the moon with an unknown quantity of fuel left in the tanks and the, and the low fuel alert um, blaring in the cabin. So from that day forward, it, it remains one of the biggest challenges in, in, uh, in, in low gravity fluid physics is figuring out how much is in the tank because our traditional methods of, of gauging uh, liquids in, inside containers uh, really fails us in, the, in that circumstance. So um, before we start, I'll give you a little bit of context as to where I am. I think you guys are all over the world. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where I am. It does not look like this right now outside my office window. It's, I've got about four inches of snow uh, instead of this more bucolic scene. So I'm in um, Kenosha, Wisconsin. We're about midway between Milwaukee and Chicago, right on the border between the states of, of Illinois and, and Wisconsin. And it's a, the reason I show this, uh, this picture um, and the next one, which tells you exactly where I am, building on the north side of the campus there, is that it's a pretty quirky context for a space sciences program. In the States, you know, we have the R1 universities that have big budgets and, and uh, lots of grad students and ongoing research programs to, to do cool stuff. Uh, but we also have these, these smaller players like uh, the college that I'm at, which has entirely an undergraduate population, um, no real uh, you know, research to speak of other than these, these types of projects that I've been involved in. And we are considered what, you know, by, by most folks, what would be a teaching college. So our primary mission is to, is to have small classes, one-on-one um, -on -one interactions between professors and students, and a much more, uh, you know, direct engagement uh, between students and faculty, but, but not the kind of um, large NSF funding that you'd associate with a, with a, a space sciences program. But I think that's the beauty of the, of the current moment is that it allows us uh, the, the revolution in the last 10 years, 15 years in, in space sciences has really democratized space for a lot of us. In fact, there are hobbyists and, and all sorts of non-professionals who are engaged in space research because the price points and the access has come down so dramatically to the point where you know, a Yahoo like me and a bunch of students can have, uh, in the last three years, we've had three suborbital um, flight experiments on, on a Blue Origins New Shepard vehicle, uh, have worked on ISS experiments and others just because uh, of this broader democratization of access to space, largely facilitated by um, some of the commercial space um, movements in the last 15 years. So what have we been up to? Um, well, really uh, more recently, these payload experiments on, on New Shepard uh, have been about some fluid physics experiments. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about one of those um, as the bulk of this talk. But uh, this is a list of some other activities that we've been involved in. The general theme here is that I go find a problem that is too big for um, one person to solve, but too small for a NASA center or a, a company to address. You know, they're just not gonna throw the resources at, at, at small problems. Um, so these, these problems that fit in the interstitials between individual PIs and, and large agencies or, or centers. And then I partner with the PI at, at the NASA center or at the, at the company and uh, write grants to support the um, addressing of, of these various problems. So liquid mass gauging, um, transfer of, of liquids between, propellant, between tanks in, in microgravity, slosh control of uh, launch vehicle tanks, as well as slosh control of, of smaller satellite tanks. Those are some of the, of the projects that we've worked on. You can see um, a group of us in front of the Blue Origin New Shepard capsule there in the lower, uh, lower left. Uh, payloads still visible in the, in the window, as well as the um, the mannequin that they always fly on these payload missions they always reserve a little bit of space for uh, man, uh, Manny the mannequin on, on payload flights with Blue Origin. So aside from uh, those for the last uh, 10 plus more than 10 years now, 
We've been doing about two flight experiments a year, partnering with different NASA centers to address problems like how do you get rid of lunar dust in a, in a habitat? If you're gonna live on the moon, um, you're gonna to need to keep that air clean and you wanna do this without um, replaceable media because at $10,000 US dollars uh, per kilogram launch costs, you don't wanna to have to be sending too many filters up. So we developed a, a system that used cyclone filters to remove lunar dust from the air in a way that doesn't require any replaceable media. Um, repose angles of lunar regolith. If you're, gonna, um, if you're going to do civil engineering on the moon, you need to be able to uh, understand how to dig channels and how to safely um, provide foundational support for structures. And to do that, you need to know some of the uh, properties of, of, the, of the lunar dirt or the regolith. And so um, we were one of the first groups to do um, lunar Re, uh, lunar repose angles of, of realistic regolith simulants in a vacuum environment on a, on a parabolic flight. So if you're not familiar with these kinds of flights, these are um, aircraft, just regular aircraft where the seats have been removed. This one in particular is a 727 for most of these shots. And the seats have been removed. And instead of seats, there are pads everywhere. And you take off just like a regular aircraft and then execute a series of about 30 in, in the current context of commercial providers, 30 parabolas that last about 22 to 30 seconds for zero G to lunar G uh, environments. And at the end of that, you pull out of it and you come back and do another one. So we'll do in a typical campaign, we'll do about 30 parabolas of flight. When I would fly with NASA in the early days, we would do up to 80 parabolas of flight, which is really pushing the limits of the aircraft and how long um, that thing should really be uh, in microgravity before the bubbles in the hydraulic system start to introduce risk. So I've done 80, and I think that's about as many as anybody has done it at one time. But over the years, um, at eight flights per campaign, um, or eight flights per year, really, 30 parabolas uh, Per campaign, uh, per flight, 22 seconds of zero G. It, it, it ends up being about an hour and a half of free flow time every year, which is my, that's my goal is to, is to be in microgravity at least an hour and a half every year. So, um, but to give you a little bit of context for this, that was microgravity. Of course, we know um, that there are really four challenges of doing any kind of science in space. And, and the first one is, is vacuum. You got no air, so you need to, you need to understand the properties of materials and the properties of your own physiology in the absence of air pressure. And on the left there is a, a former student of mine who is in uh, what's called the, the hypobaric chamber where um, the air is slowly removed and you wear a mask and you're breathing oxygen. And then at stages like at 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet and so on, you take the mask off and they have you do a math test or they have you count the number of legs on a giraffe, something really basic. So you begin to understand your own physiological response to hypoxia or the absence of, of air pressure. And the reason that we do this is because often on, or occasionally I should say, on these parabolic flights, um, you will lose cabin pressure and the masks do not fall from the ceiling as they do on a commercial aircraft. So you have to know your own signals for hypoxia and begin to um, be aware of those in, in case that happens. And in, in my case, it did happen once. And my first signal that we had lost cabin pressure, we had what's called a explosive cabin depressurization, which is the worst kind. My first signal is that it was snowing inside the cabin of the aircraft. I couldn't see anything because snow was coming down and ice crystals were forming on, on my on my arm. So I started to realize that something was wrong. I teach thermodynamics for a living, but the lack of oxygen had made my brain a little bit slow. And it took me quite a while to figure out that, that, uh, that that's what was happening. In retrospect, it was funny because it's snowing in the cabin, kind of obvious that shouldn't be happening. Um, the second effect, of course, is radiation. And we're pretty familiar with uh, the damaging effects that radiation has on body. But uh, for, for me, the primary concern is what effect it has on our electronics. So if we're gonna put something into space, we need it to recover gracefully from all of the blue screens of death that we expect to encounter because of the enhanced radiation environment in, in space. Even in low earth orbit, um, we get quite a bit of radiation. And um, th this is why hardware is so many years delayed. So the computers that run modern telescopes and instruments in space are generations behind 
uh, what you have on your desktop because of the uh, the years and expense that goes into certifying them for um, for radiation environments. But as I was saying earlier, part of the democratization of space has been this recent discovery that as access barriers drop to putting stuff in space, we are discovering that these cheap pieces of hardware that we can go buy down at Best Buy or at any store in town um, are actually good enough for many space applications. So we call these COTS devices for consumer off the shelf. And I think one of the, the biggest revolutions in, in space research recently has been the fact that you don't need a, an expensive piece of hardware that's been certified by NASA over a period of decade to survive low earth orbit. You can just put it up there at, at the expense, at the price points we have now and hope for the best. If it doesn't work, throw another one up there. Launches are getting cheaper. Hardware is certainly cheap if it's, if it's COTS off the shelf. As an example of that, um, on our modal propellant gauging experiment, which I'm gonna talk about, NASA Johnson Space Center has been working to develop the hardware, the electronics, so-called avionics that will run some of our algorithms uh, on, a, on a vehicle that's destined for the moon. The cost of this project has become prohibitive because of the radiation hardening of that electronics. So an alternate path is to take something like an Arduino, which many of you are familiar with, these, these small computers that you can buy for $30, or a Raspberry Pi, same thing, and code, code our materials and our algorithms on these cheap sensors and just multiply them to the point where we've reduced the risk that all of them will fail in the event of a, of a cosmic ray or other particle that, that's, that strikes and upsets the electronics. So we're really um, achieving reduced risk through scale and through the cheapness of the electronics rather than the radiation hardening. And we can reduce the cost of the avionics by orders of magnitude in doing that. So I think that's another um, big part of the revolution in, in terms of the democratization of, of space and access to the space environment for, uh, for researchers. And finally, uh, before we get to microgravity, we need to be aware of the fact that every 90 minutes you're going to go up through about 500 degrees Fahrenheit or you know more than 100 degrees uh, Celsius change in, in temperature as you go from day to night in space and your electronics have to be have to be hardened and um, and it's not so much a matter of keeping them warm but of but of removing the heat that you get when you're exposed to direct sunlight in low earth orbit so, that's, that's actually just a design challenge. It doesn't require the, the expense that um, we think about when we think of radiation hardening. So those are, the, those are the three challenges, but of the four, I think the biggest challenge for uh, sustained human presence in space is just this simple microgravity environment, the absence of gravity. If you think about when, when astronauts first um, were launched into space, let's say with Yuri Gagarin or, or Alan Shepard, we didn't even know whether the heart would continue to pump blood um, in the absence of gravity or whether there would be unstable uh, you know, arteries that, that uh, undergo liquid instabilities and start fluctuating around the pulse of, of blood that's moving through them and cause embolisms. We didn't know if there would be gas exchange and two-phase flow within the arteries. We didn't know whether somebody could swallow. Uh, all of these were unknowns um, at the time of the, uh, of, of the first space flight. So it's really quite, um, it was quite a brave move to put a human in space. And there had been other primates and even dogs prior to, prior to people, but nonetheless, it was a pretty, um, pretty bold move to put somebody into that environment um, for the first time. We've learned a lot since then, not enough, because we now know that there are changes in genetic expression in microgravity all throughout the body. Um, bone loss, muscle loss, eyesight damage, uh, that, that list that you can see there, all of these are, are uh, essentially unsolved problems in, in space physiology. One of the biggest is how do you grow food in space? And you can see um, Markel and the others in this shot, they're extremely happy to have grown the first little shards or slivers of lettuce in space. That was a big moment because it's very difficult to, to grow food in space. One of the reasons that it's so difficult is that you put a drop of water on a plant root and because of the surface tension of that water and the capillary effect, 
that drop of water is going to fully encompass that root tip and trigger the drowning reflex, which is a, a genetic response to being coated in water. The plant doesn't know it's a drop of water. It assumes that the root is entirely submersed. And so a, a drowning reflex is triggered and, and the plant withers and dies um, to conserve energy. You know, it, can, it can die if it remains in that state. So how do you do something as simple as water a plant? Without gravity, there is no convection. So that poisonous oxygen that the leaves of a plant uh, transpire, just sit on the surface of, of the leaf, essentially asphyxiating the plant because without, I mean, there's the heat generated by the leaf, but there, without gravity, there's no buoyancy. And so there's no convective transport of gases in space. And so that blob of O2 that sits on the leaf can just asphyxiate the plant, just a tiny amount. So you need to design these chambers um, to, to grow food and they're expensive and cumbersome and so it was a big deal when people were finally able to, to eat space-grown uh, lettuce. On the more trivial side, um, you might recognize this as uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who is um, an Italian astronaut, is an Italian astronaut, and wanted to drink good Italian espresso in space. And um, everybody's experience with drinking or eating anything in space is that you, you uh, insert a tube into a sort of a a packet and you suck it through, thus eliminating 50% of the taste response that your body has to, um, to, to food on, on, on the earth. Normally when we eat or drink something, about half of that response, that, that sensation of taste comes from the olfactory senses in our nose. And you don't get that if you're sucking coffee through a straw. So that was her you know, desire was to have a decent cup of coffee in space. And of course, the solution to that is a little bit of fluid physics. And you can see her enjoying the fruits of, of the labors of a couple people, Don Pettit, uh, an astronaut, uh, who had first designed what's called the capillary cup. It's a cup that um, essentially allows you to have a liquid free surface in, in, in microgravity without the liquid uh, floating off in, into the cabin. And the way uh, he thought of this is that liquids like to adhere to interior angles. And so he designed a, a very primitive, not what you see here, but a very primitive um, folded bag that would allow you to smell the coffee and not have it float away and still be able to, to drink out of it. A colleague, uh, Mark Weislogel at, at Portland State University, um, then worked with Don Pettit to design what, uh, what the astronaut you see here is holding. And that in more detail looks like that cup. And he and his students at Portland State University used uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD to design a cup that would, could be really tossed and tumbled through the cabin while it maintains that nice uh, free liquid interface and, and keeps the, the liquid inside the container while still allowing you to, uh, to smell it. So that cup is kind of a popular and odd looking shape that I think, uh, you could make a lot of money on uh, one day if you tried to sell it. I've tried to buy them, but they're not available yet. Um, so all of that is, is based on this idea that uh, you see here demonstrated in something that you might have seen in primary school in the US, uh, a capillary tube system. So obviously it's a liquid um, and the liquid sits in tubes of different diameter. And because of the adhesion between the liquid and the, the tube wall, um, you see the differential effects of, of that adhesion as the tube wall gets smaller and smaller, the liquid climbs up the tube and the column gets, gets higher and higher. That is surface tension driven flow and it's fighting gravity. In the absence of gravity, you have a situation that looks more entirely like the, the um, picture on the right there, the tube on the right with surface adhesion pulling that liquid up the capillary tube all the way, except this will happen in containers of any size in, in microgravity, not just thin tubes. So getting to the bulk of the talk, what I really wanna talk about is how that plays out in propellant tanks and how we can exploit that to figure out how much is in the tank. So here you have on the left, um, the Orion crew capsule is uh, you know the next, big thing that sits on top of the large moon rocket called SLS or Space Launch System that's due to launch Artemis 1 
uh, mission out of Kennedy Space Center sometime this this quarter. So within the you know the next few months, probably I think no earlier than March. So it, uh, there are four of these in the Orion uh, service module, European service module, which is, sits right underneath the crew capsule. Four of these propellant tanks. They they carry hydrazine, MMH, monomethyl hydrazine, and, and an oxidizer. And we did some early modeling um, of the fluid in those tanks for uh, the conditions of microgravity that they'll experience once launched. And you can see here three different fill fractions. As you go from left to right in these images, you're looking at low to high fill fractions. And of course, the idea is that the liquid entirely adheres to the tank wall. Um, as long as there's enough liquid to do so, it will fully coat the, the inside uh, wall of the tank. And on the left, there's just not enough liquid to do it, but it does you know, coat the, the domes. This is a very low fill fraction, just trace amounts of liquid. But essentially you have no blobs in the center, as you might expect. You have entirely uh, surface adhesion to the walls. The, the gas bubble that sits inside, that's colored uh, white in these pictures, is called the ullage. And, that's where you know the the vapor phase sits. The rest of it is liquid, and it and it um, attaches itself to the walls. And we're going to use that as a means of of uh, gauging the amount of liquid in the tank in zero gravity. So there's a picture of the European service module fully assembled, at least the tanks inside it fully assembled. Um, and now, of course, this sits underneath the. Uh, Orion crew capsule inside the vehicle assembly building at Kennedy Space Center. So um, what does this have to do with gauging? Well, um, Artemis and Orion are part of this larger vision that, that NASA, the ESA, and, and other uh, global space agencies have for um, ultimately building a space station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. And um, Gateway is going to be our sort of stepping stone to the lunar surface, allow sorties from Gateway, which will be a, a temporary housing for astronauts, um, sit in orbit around L2, and allow sorties down to the surface of the moon, and allow craft to dock uh, to the space station as they come and go from, from the Earth. So the heart of the of the Gateway Space Station is something called the Power and Propulsion Element, or the PPE. And because of its distance from the Earth, the PPE needs to serve as sort of a gas station for, um, for visiting spacecraft. It needs to refuel these spacecraft. So one of the projects that we've worked on most recently with Maxar, uh, the contractor to NASA that's building the PPE, is to gauge, um, figure out a way to gauge the amount of propellant in the tank and ultimately figure out how to know where the liquid is inside that tank. So on the right side, you see a, a CFD model of the power and propulsion element main tank. It's a spherical tank. Ultimately, it will be about 64. Um, it'll, I think it'll be 64 inches in diameter. And we need to know where that liquid is so that when we open the vent during refueling, which you have to do, you don't spray out um, you don't spray out uh, toxic hydrazine compounds into the space environment near the station. So we're, we're trying to use our gauging system to figure out where that propellant sits when it's inside the um, power and propulsion element. But this problem, as I mentioned in the beginning, has been around since uh, the lunar landing on, on the, uh, during the Apollo program. When Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the low fuel alert indicated that Neil Armstrong had less than 30 seconds of fuel left. And at that point, he was several, well, ni about 90 feet above the surface of the moon and uh, translating horizontally over a boulder field that of, of unknown length, not a safe place to land. So with nerves of steel and the, and the story that you know we've all heard many times, um, was able to ignore that alert. He knew that the fuel gauging system on the LEM was not to be trusted in microgravity. and hoped for the best and put that uh, low fuel alert out of mind and, and brought this thing down as quickly as possible. But with, according to the gauges, less than 15 seconds of fuel left on, on the, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the tanks. But again, we don't know how much fuel he had left because low gravity propellant gauging is not a very robust science. So in terms of current methods, here are the, uh, this is the breakdown of how we do gauging right now, so survey of current methods. There are essentially four different types. Um, 
And two of them, the point sensors and the interface involve really um, direct measurements of, of the liquid content of the tank. So point sensors essentially, um, uh, for example, the liquid point sensor that you can see uh, diagrammed here, this is just a photodiode and a, and a photoreceptor and some sort of uh, optical medium. So that when the, when, the, when the light source here indicated on the right is immersed in a liquid, uh, there's no total internal reflection and the, and the light signal will pass right from the prism into the liquid medium and will not return to the photosensor. In the absence of that liquid medium in a gas, let's say, uh, that light beam will be totally internal, internally reflected within the prism and return to the photocell indicating that you have gas and not liquid. This all works great in 1G, but as you can imagine from the examples that I've discussed in, in, uh, in 0G, this liquid, regardless of how much is in the tank itself, liquid likes to adhere to surfaces. It will cling to surfaces through adhesion in the absence of gravity. And so you'll get liquid uh, indications regardless of how much is, is actually available. Just like the plant drowning in a drop of, of water, um, a small amount of liquid will adhere to every surface element in, inside the tank, rendering these point sensors pretty useless. Capacitance probes work the same way. There were capacitance probes inside the shuttle tanks, um, in the, you know, inside the uh, OMS tanks of the shuttle, the orbital maneuvering systems. And they were uh, very quickly, astronauts learned not to rely on them because the liquid would cling to the central rod here, which was one of the two electrical conductors that formed the capacitor. And the liquid propellant would be the dielectric medium. And the idea was that you would use the varying amounts of liquid uh, and therefore the varying amounts of dielectric to measure a capacitance, and that would tell you how much fuel you had available. Well, when you have liquid adhering up and down the length of the tube, regardless of how much is in the tank, doesn't work. So these capacitance probes were pretty useless in zero G. The other two methods are just kind of keeping track of how much you turn the engines on and off. So just bookkeeping and equations of state, measuring pressures and temperatures, and then in, in, and figuring out from pressure and temperature, how much volume uh, you have of gas and therefore how much volume you have of liquid. All of these methods um, fail for various reasons. The, the first two I've described, the second two just get worse and worse in terms of accuracy as you empty out the tank. So um, not great. So there's an example of the shuttle uh, capacitance probes inside what's called the ohms pod or the, the orbital maneuvering system pod. These are tanks that are about nine feet long and they had these long uh, probes down the middle and at great expense, we discovered very early on in the shuttle program that they were uh, essentially useless. So um, this is a summary of what I just said, but all of them get worse and worse as in terms of accuracy, the relative error grows uh, as you move forward in the mission, this blue line here, except for one of them, which is thermal propellant gauging. Um, that one gets better and better, but those systems are very touchy and very complicated, and they've only been implemented on a couple uh, small satellite systems. So that's where we stand with gauging and, and MPG or mobile propellant gauging. The, the subject of, of my research for the last 10 years or so is one of uh, three um, sort of candidate technologies to address this issue. And I'll, I'll just, just give you the basics of it. The, the concept is really simple. If you've ever run your finger along a rim of a wine glass, you know that by varying the amount of liquid inside that, you can get different acoustic responses. You can actually play music um, by varying the amounts of liquid. And that's essentially what we do in MPG. You can see on the right, the Orion um, European Service Module propellant tank. This is a qualification unit in the Airbus uh, facility in Bremen, Germany. Um, and on it are some of our patches, these PZT patches here that run up the side and on the domes of the, of the tank uh, are there because we were running MPG experiments on, on um, that qual tank. So our, our marketing for MPG is that it's low cost, um, non-invasive. It doesn't involve any penetrations into the tank, which is really important for propellant tanks that might contain cryogens that you wanna keep cold can't introduce any sort of heat paths or leakage paths. It's tank agnostic, works on spheres, cylinders, whatever uh, shape your tank is. 
And it's propellant agnostic. So it works with these toxic earth storables, but it also works with uh, cryogenic propellants like hydrogen or oxygen. And, and it's native, natively zero G because it relies on that surface tension effect of the liquid adhering to the, um, uh, to the tank wall. So um, this is the idea. The context is that there are no high TRL microgravity liquid mass gauges. And we want to show that we can beat the current state of the art gauging accuracy, which is about five to 10% of the full tank volume. We can get down to about uh, sub 1% uh, gauging errors on, on, on our method, which would save, in the case of the Orion propellant system, about 430 kilograms of payload mass. So you can use that margin that would otherwise go to propellant um, and put it into uh, payload mass. So here's, here's the basic idea. We're going to treat the uh, propellant tank as if it were a, a, a resonating object, like a musical instrument, uh, a, a resonant chamber. And in doing so, in the traditional physics way of turning everything into a spherical cow, we can think of the tank as a, as a simple uh, damped oscillator. So a mass attached to a spring. And a mass attached to a spring has a, has a vibrational frequency that we can predict and calculate. And it's damped by the material properties, which doesn't really affect its uh, vibration frequencies. And so when we add liquid to that tank wall, we're adding mass, which should then reduce the frequencies that we record. So it's that simple. Of course, a real tank is really an infinite set of coupled oscillators. So the mathematics gets a little bit more challenging, but the concept is the same. We just have a spring mass oscillator, which any first year physics student would have seen. And the liquid that adheres to the tank wall affects the mass and therefore affects the resonant frequencies. So that's the, that's the simple idea. And the implementation of it is that we put these very flexible um, sensors that were developed by NASA in the 90s to, to do really highly sensitive, highly resolved uh, so-called structural health monitoring. So they can, they can listen for the slightest um, change in, in uh, vibration response of a structure that might indicate a, uh, an incipient crack or fracture. Um, they can listen for that kind of response and then um, at sensitivity levels that are on, on the level of microvolts. So what we do is we put a white noise signal into the, into the tank that's like rubbing the rim of the glass through this actuator. And then we listen for that sensor, that, that signal at two different locations labeled sensor and monitor using these flexible PZT patches that are just basically glued onto the outside of the tank. By taking the, the Fourier transform, which is a mathematical operation you don't have to worry about if you're not familiar with it, of both of these signals, we divide out the common noise between them and are left with only the frequencies or the tones that the tank itself introduces into the, uh, in, in, into the noise. So the, the resonant frequencies of the tank itself are left. So you see on the right, we end up with what's called a frequency response function that gives us the the tones of the tank, the natural frequencies of that tank. And those then will shift as you add and remove liquid from the tank. And to give you an idea of how sensitive it is on a tank that maybe, you know, a small tank that I could fit on my table here that might be two gallons. If I took out a couple of teaspoons, my system MPG could detect that amount and indicate that through the frequency shifts that you see in that so-called F uh, frequency response function. So that's, that's how we implement it. Um, there's a sort of raw data to show you what it looks like if you drain a tank from 31% full to 10%. You can see we can easily see these shifts of, of about a percent and a half between uh, the peaks at this particular location in the, in the frequency response function. So where have we tested it? We've put it on the shuttle ohms tank. Um, there's a shuttle ohms tank at Kennedy Space Center that we used. We've put it on the Orion European Service Module tank. Um, we've done a hot fire test on what's called the Morpheus prototype lander, which is a, a concept lander that was built by NASA to test concepts in, in um, building planetary landers. So we, we conducted that test during a hot fire to show that our system was not affected by the 
vibrations introduced um, in an engine burn. And in, in general, the idea is that we've done some ground tests on real flight systems like I've described, but also these parabolic flight tests to demonstrate that it works in zero gravity. So initially on parabolic flights and then on, on the suborbital flights with, with the Blue Origin New Shepard vehicle and uh, Virgin Galactic um, Spaceship One. Ultimately, we haven't flown on that one yet, but we've flown on the, on the uh, New Shepard. So what's next for us is implementing this on, hopefully on the exploration upper stage, which is the upper stage of the SLS vehicle um, that will ultimately be used when, uh, for the first human, uh, human missions with Artemis. And probably more likely in the near future is implementing it on a commercial lunar lander called the Nova C, which is being developed right now by Intuitive Machines. That vehicle is, is a natural, um, next step for us because that Nova CU is based on the Morpheus prototype lander that we've we've been testing on. But I'll, I'll just point out that these suborbital payloads that are shown here at the top, those were all developed by uh, our students, uh, entirely undergraduate students here, um, to test MPG in, in the zero gravity environment. The, the real trick though is turning um, modal responses or resonant modes into, you know, actual how much fuel is in the tank? How many gallons do you have? How many liters of propellant are left? So these gauging algorithms are really the translation from the sound data, the acoustic data into the uh, contained liquid mass data. So there are, are several that we've developed, the point sensor method, the spectral density method, um, and the cross correlation method. I'm just gonna talk about the cross correlation method here uh, because that's the one that, that seems to have the most legs for, uh, for zero G. So it's really quite a simple Im implementation. You have um, these, here's a, a, a model transparent tank and two sensors you can see, um, one at the top of the tank, one down near the bottom, and then an actuator that introduces the white noise excitation into the tank. And you can see these raw signals that contain the mysterious frequencies that we're looking for. When we take the Fourier transform of those, which is a mathematical operation that, that finds the frequency components and then ratio those, those Fourier transforms, we get the FRF, so the frequency response functions. And that's what tells us how much water is in the tank and that's what we look to, to shift. Now with, um, you know, we look for the shifts due to the, due to the liquid. Now with the, um, with the cross correlation approach to modal propellant gauging, what we're doing is we're comparing a, a real time um, frequency response function or FRF to a library of FRFs that are taken with known values of the contained mass. And we're just using a cross correlation um, analysis to determine which of these is the best match and therefore which of the library FRFs represents the, the you know the true mass of the of the liquid at that at that instant. So graphically, here's what we do. We have in the lower right here. I have a, an FRF with an unknown mass. Let's say it's happening right now as the spacecraft is is uh, being gauged, and we want to know you know how much is how much is in the tank right now. So I'm going to compare it to these library values with known masses. And the masses here are in liters. Um, this is taken with a real, these are real data sets from the small tank system that you just saw, the transparent cylinder tank. So uh, the Pearson correlation coefficient for that one is 0.5. That's not good enough. We want it up near one. So we're just going to keep rejecting these until we come across one that matches pretty well. So that, that one looks good. The correlation coefficient there is almost one. And the next one is 0.69. So I think we found a match with that uh, one third from the third from the top. So the, we associate the unknown FRF with the mass of the reference file and say, okay, we know how much is in that tank. That's the, that's the approach that we're using. So how does it work? Well, on the shuttle ohms tank, um, we've got a, a, some drain data here from a drain of about full 4,200 pounds of water in the tank to, uh, to empty. I apologize because American engineering uses uh, Imperial units. And um, I'm from a physics community. We use metric like civilized humans, but to talk to engineers. So we use Imperial as well. Uh, so we get about a 0 
percent error. That is, our error is, is comparable to the uncertainty in the facility mass curve um, for this particular drain. So it, it works quite well. That is, we're using a previous drain to, pre um, to predict how much is in the tank at any one instant using uh, MPG. There's another one uh, from the Orion uh, European Service Module qual, qual tank qualification unit where we do a pressure cycle using the cross correlation method. So the pressure is varying, the, the amount of liquid in the tank is varying, and we're still able to do some disengaging. And I think I'm pretty much near the end of my time here. So I want to um, I want to end with just a couple uh, slides showing you how we do this in zero G. We can't use the 1G drain data to predict 0G data. So what we're doing instead, because the, the, the acoustics of a tank that's loaded in zero gravity are very different than in, in under Earth's gravity. So what we do is we develop these fairly high fidelity uh, computational models that predict um, how the resonant response of the tank will look in microgravity. And we use that as our reference data to predict um, 0G, 0G data behavior. So for you, computational science wonks. Um, it's a coupled model that involves CFD as well as finite element. Um, but the point is we're using computers to predict the acoustic response. And we did this on a, a Blue Origin New Shepard mission recently. And you can see there in the uh, lower right is the capsule loaded with these payload lockers. And there's a, a view of the, of the booster vehicle launching. And the mission profile is suborbital. The booster comes up and goes down. The capsule free flies for a little bit longer and comes down on parachute. So we get about 160 seconds or so of good zero G uh, microgravity time before the atmosphere starts to build up and introduce um, forces on the, on the crew capsule again. So we flew a couple different experiments in this context. One was the NS uh, New Shepard P9 mission. We called this one TRIO because it had three tanks and they were static fill levels, couldn't vary the fill but we got some good zero G data from that, used colorful liquids and it looked really cool. So let me show you a, a little video clip of that. And um, I don't know if the sound was coming through, but you can hear the sound from our actuators on this. And we're about to hit Miko or main engine cutoff. There it is. And you can watch the uh, zero G equilibrium shape form. That is the liquid adheres to the outside of, of the tank or the, the inside wall of the, of the tank leaving this void in the center. It's all, all air in the center. And we have three different tanks. So you see the inset of the third tank there on the right. The crew capsule separates gently a little bit later. And then we have from this point forward, we have about 160 seconds of, of good zero G time. And the liquid just settles into nice spherical uh, equilibrium shapes there. So I won't play you the whole 160 seconds because it gets boring. It looks just like that. but. Our next flight, um, you know, there's some data. I won't spend too much time talking about the data, except to point out that the finite element analysis agreed with the computational predictions we made analytically and agreed with the, with the lab data to within you know, reasonable uh, expectations. Our next experiment was to fly a similar system, but with a spherical tank that modeled that uh, power and propulsion element sphere tank. Um, it had what's called PMD on the inside, the propellant management device, these capillary veins that attract liquid, and it had a catch tank as well. And this one allowed us to do dynamic drains to simulate uh, propellant transfer during, during refueling operations in, in zero gravity. So we're going to drain liquid from the main tank into the receiver tank here, or the catch tank on the right. So uh, that's a little different view of it. You can see this is the receiver tank without any propellant management inside it. This is the, the main tank and some uh, fluid handling stuff up here and the PMD vein and sponge design of the, of the propellant tank there on the right. So what does that look like? Uh, pretty cool actually to see this in zero G. So let me show you. Um, we're coming up on, on Miko here again. So there's main engine cutoff and we'll see the liquid forming its nice spherical shape. I'm going to kill the sound so you can hear me. And you can see our PZT sensors attached to the walls of the tank on the outside. And uh, this is all, you know, empty space in the middle here. There's crew capsule separation, just as we had before. 
And we're gonna take a little bit of time here and there's an outside view showing you that indeed the liquid adheres entirely to that, to that tank. So shortly after the, the liquid more or less settled in its zero G uh, configuration, we started a drain and the drain lasts for about 40 seconds. So I won't uh, walk you through the whole thing, but um, we, we were able to do a, a drain from the sump on the bottom of that tank in the lower right into the catch tank. You can begin to see that catch tank filling up in the lower left as that liquid is sort of suctioned out of the, out of the experimental tank. And here you begin to see what's we're calling recirculation, which is that water is now leaving the, the catch tank and coming back into, um, into the main tank. And we knew that would happen and wanted to see if our system was sensitive enough to pick up uh, that recirculation dynamics. And, and indeed, we were able to see signals of, of recirculation on the, on the PZT signal. So we did, you know, we have 160 seconds to play with. So there's a, a fill coming up here in a minute. Um, which is, let me just skip to that if I can. Here we are, Apogee at about 347,000 feet. And now we're gonna begin, begin filling the tank. So basically reversing that process. And you'll start to see liquid coming up out of the sump at the bottom right and splashing into the tank and then forming that equilibrium surface on the walls. One of the features of, of liquid transfer in microgravity is two-phase flow. You see a lot of uh, bubbles in that liquid. Um, under normal gravity, the bubbles would rise uh, buoyantly, lower density than the liquid, and separate from the liquid phase. You don't have that separation in microgravity, so most flows are going to be two-phase. Okay, so from a data perspective, we did, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you too much with the data, but we were able to use cross-correlation to predict um, pretty accurately what our, our fill levels and uh, um, both during static periods and during drains and also during fills, what, what those were. So I know I'm running short on time here and I think um, just in the interest of time, I will uh, just, show you my acknowledgement slide and offer to take any questions about the, the work that we've been doing on mobile propellant gauging or other projects. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. This was absolutely amazing uh, to, to see and, and the videos were really cool. And we have so many questions. I don't know if we will have time to go through them. So please, if you have to leave at some point, just let us know and, and, and we will- oh, we Oh, that's perfect then. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I will start because the, the MPG approach has raised several questions in the audience. So I will start with, with them. And there are actually three questions that are more or less the same, which is uh, how does the MPG account for a slush? Or in other words, what uh, happens when the liquid detaches from the walls and you cannot actually decide the, the vibration modes? That's a, that, that is a great question because we can't. Um, so. And, the, and right now there are no current gauging methods that really uh, robustly accommodate slosh. So what we do in the parabolic flights, which are entirely slosh, is we calculate what the slosh period should be. So it's easy to calculate at a given fill fraction what the slosh period should be. And then we average over that slosh. So we, we can get down to about two to 3% gauging accuracy, um, which is still better than, better than state of the art. Uh, during slosh and parabolic flights, but um, true slosh is, you know, fairly chaotic and unpredictable, but it's not as interesting from a gauging standpoint because we're talking about deep space operations and that slosh for, for the tank geometry and the liquid properties, one can predict how long it takes to settle out. So eventually all of that, that slosh will, will be viscously damped. It might take seconds uh, in a small tank with a highly wetting liquid like water. It might take hours in a, long, in a large tank with a, a, a propellant like hydrazine, but it will settle out. And you know, we know how, how long that's gonna take. And if we're not dynamically gauging during an engine burn, you know, we, we're not gonna be too worried about that. 
during an engine burn, there's going to be very little slosh because you're, you're settled, essentially. You've got a force on that liquid that settles it. But the, answer, you know, the, the, the slippery answer is we don't worry about that, but the real answer is we can't do it very accurately. <laughs> the, I, I have a follow-up question on that. So you have mentioned that the propellant will settle at some point. But I wonder, I mean, if a sphere, in a spherical tank, you will adopt a very well-determined equilibrium surface, right? But you have, for instance, a launch stage where you have all sorts of, all sorts of propellant management devices. The liquid will settle in different places in a kind of random way, right? How does that affect the measurement method? Um, so in, in the microgravity environment, that's why we need to do these fairly high fidelity uh, coupled CFD finite element simulations to make those predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are another two questions about the MPG, which are related with how do you interact with the propellant management devices inside the tank? Or how do you account for them? How do you design a tank in such a way that you need to account both for the PMD uh, design requirements and also for the gouging requirements? How do, how do those problems interact? So in, in the case of the, um, the spherical tank video that I showed you, the, the PMD was, the tank itself was designed to have the same properties, the same scale, uh, prop, scaled properties as the main tank on the Maxar power and propulsion element. Partly because we did the CFD on that tank as part of our uh, partnership with them to figure out, you know, is there gonna be propellant near the vent port when you want to transfer propellant from one tank to another. Bad idea to have propellant near the vent. So we needed to know, is there a fill fraction below which you do not get propellant up there? So we did all of our analysis on a fairly um, high fidelity model of that tank and then built a subscale model for these tests. Uh, and of course, when you scale down liquid properties, you, you cannot scale all of the properties. So we're not gonna get the same dynamics in the, in the new Shepard flight as you'll see on the real tank. In particular, we knew that even though we had a PMD in that tank, um, it wasn't gonna do anything because we were using water as a propellant simulant and water is um, not particularly highly wetting. So it doesn't interact with the PMD much, but this was phase one of a multi-step project where the next time we fly that type of tank, we're going to be flying it with a, a propellant simulant that has a much higher surface tension. And so we'll interact with the PMD um, in more realistic ways. So we're, we're still in early stages with that work. The first flights were just with water and water doesn't really do much with PMD. Okay, Matt has just asked a question. I think that you already answered, but I will ask it anyway because it is related with our current discussion, which is how sensitive is the MPG method to tank materials? For instance, if you use composites or, and, and the kind of propellant too. Yeah, so uh, from a basic physics standpoint, we've done this with COPVs or carbon overwrap pressure vessels. So uh, carbon composite tanks, um, we've done it with, titanium, flight tanks, aluminum. So, you know, uh, the, the metallic tanks are, as you might expect, ring really well. They have good acoustic properties. So we're gonna be able to work really well with any, any metallic tank. Um, it has worked with, with uh, carbon overwrap pressure vessels, COPVs, and it's worked with carbon composites. Those ring pretty well. As you could see in the, in the videos, we, in our simple experiments, we use transparent plastics, basically polycarbonate, um, which, you know, not the best acoustic materials, but we can still get, you, know, you still get decent measurements out of it. The real trick is what kind of propellants does it work with? Because we rely on the liquid added mass effect. And so far our experiments have been with water, liquid nitrogen, um, liquid oxygen, methane. A big unknown for us is whether this is gonna work with liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen is very low density. It's order of magnitude uh, less dense than traditional propellants. Um, and that low density means lower added mass effect, smaller frequency shifts. So our computer modeling suggests that we'll be able to measure it um, accurately, but we haven't done it experimentally. Is there any kind of effect associated to the pressurization? So when you pressurize with helium, does that affect in any way the, the frequencies of the system? Absolutely, yeah. Um, when you pressurize a tank, you change its effective stiffness. And if you think of the, uh, think back to your freshman physics course, uh, the frequency is the is proportional not just to the inverse of the mass, 
but to the stiffness, the spring constant, square root of K over M. Mm -hmm. So when you pressurize a tank, you increase the tank stiffness, you increase the resonant frequencies. So one of our uh, papers is on something called the spectral density method, which is an attempt to untangle the effects of changing tank stiffness and changing mass due to liquid levels. But that is a complication in flight. Uh, we don't expect it to be unless there's a leak or some sort of loss of pressurization because tanks are, these tanks are really, really thin walled. And so they need to be held at a very high pressure in order to not you know, collapse. So, that, so tanks are maintained at high pressure. Interesting. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize about the, the, the impact of pressure in the stiffness of the tank, but that's actually a very good point. Uh, someone is, says that uh, he or she is curious about the impact of bubbles within fluidic lines. Uh, and methods to mitigate their creation. Oh yeah, that's the, uh, that is out of my welkin, as they say, out of my ballpark. I um, people have been working on that for years. So one of uh, the the question of two phase flow, which is bubbles entrained in liquid flow, is a big problem, particularly in things like the coolant system for a space station right now uses ammonia, highly toxic. Would love to get rid of it. A candidate fluids to replace ammonia are these engineering liquids like um, uh, perfluorohexanes and, and chlorides and the, these long carbon chains with, with uh, either usually fluor fluorine atoms on them. And these are uh, excellent two-phase materials except they, ent they entrain or they absorb a lot of oxygen. And so you have to get rid of the oxygen uh, before you can use them as, as fluids. And so one, one technique that we worked on with a group at Purdue and at NASA Glenn was to use um, so-called membrane separators, which are used in the beverage industry to filter out bubbles from like flow of, of uh, industrial fluids. And so these are just membrane filters, radial uh, filtration things that you plug into the fluid line that work whether they're in zero G or one G. In fact, the picture in the beginning of the talk of me upside down floating uh, in, in the aircraft, that was from a, uh, an experiment where we were looking at the effectiveness of removing oxygen bubbles from a flu flow line um, using these membrane filters. So there are ways to solve it, but I have to say it's not really my expertise. Interesting. Uh, someone uh, has asked, um, well, not someone, it was me actually. <laughs> the, the reference FRF, uh, F, FRF sorry, um, during the frequency response, the reference that you use, uh, did you compute that numerically, analytically using 1G experiments, 0G experiments? How is that usually computed? How do you expect to implement that in the future? Uh, yeah, so we've tried everything. I mean, you know how science works, right? You try a million things and they all fail miserably. My hope was that <laughs> we would be able to use 1G data and look for some, some fingerprints, some special portions of the, of the frequency response that were universal to the interaction between the liquid and the solid that had nothing to do with the gravitational uh, conditions. And we would zero in on that portion of the spectrum and use experimental data um, as our reference data, because it's much easier to do an experimental drain of a tank. Uh, you just drain out the tank from full to empty, and then you get your reference data, and then you use that as your library to, um, you know, your truth, your ground truth. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that did not succeed. We can we can do that really well with, you know, comparing one G data to settled zero G data. So if your if your spacecraft is settled during an engine burn or something, it works great. But we can't do it for just spacecraft floating in space because the, the liquid surface distribution is so different. The acoustics are very different. So that's why we have to use these uh, fairly sophisticated uh, computational models that start with a computational fluid dynamic simulation to solve for the distribution of liquid inside the tank, given the PMD and all of the attributes of the particular propellant, and then use that to inform a finite element model that, that then computes the FRF for us. And then you iterate that across every fill fraction that you want to see. So that is the time consuming part of this to build up this library of computational reference FRFs that you then use in flight. Um, it's doable, but it, it just, uh, it has, it's kind of a, 
it's a um, idiosyncratic to each tank and each fluid. So, you know, you don't want to have to do it too many times. Now that you mentioned the numerical simulations, I will ask you two more questions that, that I have in my list. First one is, what's the effect of wettability in your simulations or of contact angle in general? And the second is, which kind of numerical simulation methods do you use to, to model this problem? Um, so the wettability is really important. So you have to know the surface tension properties of your liquid um, as, as it contacts the particular surface of the tank. So we take the, we take the tank material properties into account in the, in the CFD and we take the liquid uh, surface tension, viscosity, temperature and so on into account in the, in the CFD part. Mm -hmm. In the finite element part, again, the liquid, uh, the, the liquid properties are just not important. It's just the distribution of liquid and its density that is important. So we get a shape from the CFD. We use that shape in the finite element model. And then we get the structural modes from the finite element model by knowing the properties of the tank material. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting. That I have uh, someone asked, um, and, and this is a more a general question: Where can you run this kind of uh, low gravity fluid physics experiments? So you have mentioned suborbital platforms, parabolic flights. Uh, which other platforms would you consider? Would you consider, for instance, drop tower experiments? Um, yeah, drop towers are are really great. In fact. Uh, there's another paper coming out soon by a group that's working on a, a competitive, uh, one of the three competing low gravity, microgravity um, propellant gauging technologies. And they've done all of their experiments so far at, Zarm, at the drop tower um, in Germany. And yeah, you can get a lot of good data from one and a half to three seconds. You know, we have a five second drop tower here in the States at Glenn. Mm -hmm. um, but you really don't, I mean, your tank size needs to be really small because the settling time for liquids in any realistic tank is on the order of minutes. So the new Shepard vehicle is just long enough at 160 seconds to give us good settled liquid geometries. We can't get that in parabolic flights, even on the smaller tanks. It's always sloshing. Mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, 22 seconds into your parabola towards the end, you have not reached a settled state. So drop towers are great, but only for um, really small, small systems. Interesting. Follow up question on the computational power that you mentioned before on computing the FRF uh, data. Someone asks, uh, no, not someone, Adam Thacker asks, uh, what kind of computational power is required to turn the MPG sensor data into a usable, usable field level? So what kind of power do you need for that? Um, to run the actual experiments, once you have the reference data, so the, the, the basic workflow is you, you spend a lot of time and a lot of compute power getting the reference library data. That's, uh, that's a hard thing, um, running the CFD in the finite element. Once you have that, the actual compute power needs to fit in an avionics head. So we run it on an FPGA system, you know, for the for the flight hardware that's being developed by NASA for um, intuitive machines in Orion, um, this, this has to run in a generations old piece of avionics that is rad hardened and uh, probably equivalent to, you know, um, a 486 CPU and Intel 486 from 30 years ago. It's not a particularly fast computer. Um, so we need, we need about a second of data not a lot of memory storage. And we update every every second based on that trailing seconds worth of data. So the hardware is not, the, the computational hardware is not particularly difficult. Okay, we have three more questions to close the MPG section of the question. As you can see, we have <laughs> a lot of very good questions today, which is fantastic. So the first one of them is, um, how do you, how do you, uh, you have mentioned before, what the scaling up and down the simulations, right? Can you give more details on that? So how do you do it and which parameters can you scale down and up and which you can't? So, um, yeah, so there, there are, unfortunately there are several so-called uh, scaling numbers that one computes when trying to think about how to scale a fluid dynamics problem. And, and we all know this, we all know intuitively that fluid dynamics doesn't scale well, because if, if you have a very detailed uh, let's say model ship, right? It looks like a, an old schooner. And 
it's just highly detailed, perfect for a movie, and it's got the highly resolved features. And you put it in a bathtub, no matter how close you zoom in, you're always going to know that that ship is in a bathtub and not out on the open seas because you have not scaled down the water properties, right? You haven't scaled the viscosity of the liquid, you haven't scaled the gravitational effects, and you haven't scaled the surface tension of, of the liquid. So um, there's some things that you just can't scale down. In experiments, when we have to take a large tank and we want to do an experiment at a subscale, we try to get as close as we can, but we never really get there. So what we'll end up doing is replacing water with, say, alcohol, which has a, a lower surface tension. And that brings parameters like the bond number, uh, the Friede number, down closer to what they should be. But you compute these parameters like the bond number, and there are basically three of them that you need uh, to get good scaling. And you try to play with densities of uh, fluids and uh, surface tensions until you can get the scaled bond number as close to the actual bond number as possible. But you can never get you know, good enough. You'll never see an a aircraft carrier in a bathtub and be um, convinced that it's out on the open ocean. Interesting. And th there is another one. I'm curious about this one too. So you are applying this to propellant gouging in, micro in microgravity in, in space propulsion, right? Which, right. other, uh, which other applications do you know about that use a similar method or which other applications can you foresee for this, uh, for this technology? Um, so, well, we're actually in talks with Airbus right now working on a similar system for commercial jets. So this is under gravity, obviously, but they still have the problem of tilt and yaw and pitch. Um, so their next generation of, of clean commercial passenger jets is going to really be interesting in this in the sense that it merges a lot of what we know about rocket technology and rocket propulsion with uh, passenger jets. So the idea is to, to use uh, liquid hydrogen propulsion on a consumer passenger jet. So the next version of, of um, Airbus vehicles 15, 20 years out, hopefully will use uh, LH2 as their fuel, very clean, um, low carbon footprint basically zero carbon footprint. The, the challenge there is gauging. And so they've come to us to work, we're working um, in a collaborative research agreement between Airbus and, and Carthage on, on implementing some of what we've learned about pro, uh, propulsion gauging systems with MPG and translating that to, uh, to Airbus. But again, the, the, the challenge is modeling the, getting the reference library so same challenges, just different context. The other application area is potable water on space station or other places. Um, there's a group that's trying to figure out how much, how, how this technology might translate to really small tanks that uh, might, we, we need to gauge liquid in, in um, onboard potable water or other liquids that are stored um, at ambient pressure on station. Well, I, I don't. Know, I'm not sure if I would like to to fly in a plane fueled with liquid hydrogen. At least not now. But <laughs> we need to see that. I ha there is another question that I have to ask you because it is, you know, for me it is very impressive that being Carthage College, a teaching institution, as you mentioned, you can carry out this. This is not simple or easy microarray research. This is very complex. The lot of different things that you have you are describing are extremely complex and require years of dedication. So. I'm very curious about this. How do you train your, your students in, in a short period of time to run all these experiments and, and collaborate between the design so, and, and analysis of all this data? I, I, I guess, I, I mean, backing up a little bit, I started, this is not my background, really. My background was in computational um, material science. So I started doing uh, essentially quantum mechanical simulations of materials under stress, uh, ab initio quantum molecular dynamics simulations. And what I discovered, I really wanted to work with undergraduates, which is why I'm here. Um, but I discovered that by the time they had the chemistry, the mathematics and the physics uh, and, the, and the programming background necessary to work in the field that I had you know, done my doctorate dissertation in, um, they were ready to graduate and were out the door. So I didn't get any time with these students. So I looked around and I, my, my secondary passion was, has always been uh, space technology. And I wanted to find something that was accessible to students and I could work with them from, from the minute they get on campus that was exciting to them and was you know I, I didn't foresee the, the the explosion of commercial space and the job opportunities that would that would be coming but there but that's just been a nice side effect of being able to grab students from their first year on campus 
as 18 year olds and say, hey, you wanna do something really cool? I think you can understand this from the get go. I'm not gonna be the one necessarily teaching you everything here. You've gotta have some drive to, to study this stuff on your own and then build a peer mentorship network where we teach each other all the time. So I learn as much from my students as, as they learn from me, but more importantly, they learn more from their peers than they do directly from me. So the juniors and seniors, you know, they've all drunk the Kool-Aid, they're totally into this, and they uh, see their, their uh, former peers getting jobs in, in space. So they're motivated to, to do the same. And they, part of the devil's bargain, if you're gonna work in my group, is that uh, every student is a mentor to all of the other students. And so you become an expert in your subsystem, then you're gonna teach that and you're gonna authentically teach it and take that uh, as seriously as you would your actual research. So and it's more of a philosophy than a, you know, than a strategy. We use a lot of project management tools and other technologies, but really it's the philosophy of, of collaborative learning and, and peer mentorship and um, creating a social environment that is welcoming and fun. I think. Well, Alan writes in the chat that this is really amazing, and I completely agree with this statement. <laughs> it's oh, it's really, you. really amazing. Uh, but let's, uh, we have a few more questions, if you still have time, because we are well over time today. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but uh, we have three, four more technical questions and some general questions. Uh, are you okay the, with uh, continuing the this conversation? I went long, so I apologize for going long. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, it was a very interesting talk. Don't worry about that. So the first technical question besides the MPG is, um, do you know how long it took to uh, design, test, and fly the coffee cup from Portland State University? You know, I, I don't know. I know that the, I, I love that story because it was it was another one done with students. Like the, the students helped really... I think drive that whole process. And it, it, I believe it came from an idea of Don Pettit's, but I know that Mark Weislobel was the one who, mm -hmm. who did the actual design work. And I don't think it took very long. This all took place between 2015 and 2016. Yeah, that, that's one of the amazing things nowadays, right? You can fly something in, in one year and, and get this technology flying out there. Yeah, I mean, and that was entirely CFD. I mean, he did the design and I, I believe the first zero-g experience it had was when it was on station very very cool uh, there is another one what would be the most crucial thing to check or confirm before a parabolic flight experiment um <laughs> wow there are so many things if if you're doing a parabolic flight in the near future please uh, contact me because i i'd love to tell you all the all the places that we have failed and all the mistakes that we've made because they they help um mitigate future mistakes but i've i've also i've been doing this for a long time now and i've seen other groups make every possible mistake too you know from not sharing passwords with your team members for computers so that when you get on board and you've got you're released into your experiment zone and you realize you've got to unlock your laptop which has gone to sleep and you don't know the password to it. I mean, stupid stuff like that to not turning auto rotate off your cameras or your, you know, not, not disabling the hard drive lock. Um, everything goes crazy in microgravity. So batteries will float out of their contacts. So if you have the little um, small batteries that you put into cameras and stuff, they will float free and the contacts will uh, no longer engage and you know, you'll have intermittent power issues. You've got to look for cold solder joints, everything, electronically has to be vibe tested and just batten down the hatches everywhere you can on your mechanical design. Um, but really the, the, the number one thing that, that people make the mistake of not doing is rehearsing and choreographing and pretending that you're a, a, uh, an actor in a show where you've got to know your lines and you've got to know exactly what you do at every second. It's not the technical stuff. It's the group work and this, and the, um, the choreographing of every move because a parabola is really short and some of you are going to get sick no matter what and you have to have backup plans and you have to rehearse those you have to have contingencies and you have to execute those and you just have to know exactly what you're going to do in every situation because it is i mean that's the fun of it right it's a big dramatic you know a, it's it's an opportunity to really shine um but you really have to rehearse it stupid stuff like i'm going to stand here 
I'm going to say this when this red light goes on and I'm going to give you the signal and it's going to be go. It's not going to be we're ready. It's going to be, go. you know, just exactly what you're going to say at every moment because nobody can hear anything. It's chaotic. It's loud. Half of you are throwing up. The other half are upside down. Um, you just you got to rehearse. Long Interesting. answer. Sorry. No, no, that's exactly what we are looking for. And, and the, the point you made about getting sick in the plane, I, I did not think about that, but you're absolutely right. You need like a plan for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we fly a lot of people on each flight because about half of them get sick. There is a question from a student um, who asks, how can I join a group working with experiments in partial gravity? Uh, so how can you join a research group working on partial gravity uh, experiments like that? Yes. I, yeah, it's it's so institutionally dependent. I know, like, uh, of course, CU Boulder has a big program. Uh, Purdue has a big program. Um, but if you're talking about, uh, was the question specifically about a school or? Yeah, I, 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 the, the, this participant didn't specify, but I think it is, this question is, is raised from the perspective of a student that is maybe I don't know, considering entering a university or doing a PhD program or, you know, my answer for this would be join AZSR and, and meet all the yeah. school people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're in AGS, ASGSR, you'll immediately be connected to people who can point you in the direction of the, of the players who regularly do this kind of work. So we, we kind of all know who they are and be happy to put you in touch with them. And, um, but you know, my, my answer to that would really be you should probably think about the kind of science you want to do first before you think about the tool, like the, <clears throat> the partial gravity research platforms like parabolic flights and suborbital. Those are tools, those are laboratories. Mm -hmm. They're fun, um, but you know, think about the science you want to do first and see if that tool is appropriate to it. There is a very funny question uh, here that I, I'm want to ask that someone asked this during the registration i don't know what's the motivation but this person asked is there a lot of funding avail available for this and um just refer to answer your <laughs> there is uh, there's increasingly uh, more funding available for this type of research my funding primarily comes from uh nasa's flight opportunities program which funds i mean their basic idea is is uh lather, rinse, and repeat, right? You, you want to be able to treat mm -hmm. the microgravity environment or the space environment generally as if it were any other laboratory. That is, we go in there with the, with the understanding that we're going to tinker, we're going to experiment, we're scientists and engineers. So we're going to probably screw something up, it's going to break, and that's okay, we're going to fly again because it's cheap enough, it's frequent enough that we can um, lather, rinse, and repeat. We can fly these experiments multiple times uh, not everything is like, in, you know, even just 10 or 15 years ago, if you had a mission to space, it was a one, one and done deal. One shot, everything better work or your career is over. Mm -hmm. These days, that's not the case. You, you can fly like I do um, four flights in a, in a campaign, two campaigns in a year um, or more if I had time. The funding is there, but the, um, you know, you've got to have a well-defined program and, and clear and actionable science goals usual that's interesting in case there are students listening right now uh, there are also really a ton of challenges student programs designed to allow students to do hands-on microarray research and not only in the us if you are european the european space agency education program has a lot of this uh, also in japan JASMA is another association you should look for and in, in Europe, the European Low Gravity Research Association, ELGRA. So uh, since we have a global audience here, just, just so you are aware of this, uh, and if, you know, we are currently renewing the SESR students website. So soon we will have all these opportunities listed there. Uh, if you are interested, just go there and, and check it out. And feel free to ask questions. We're here to ask, uh, to, to, to help you, sorry. And uh, I think that those were all of the questions we have for today. And those were a lot. We have been speaking for more than half an hour. So thank you so much, Dr. Crosby. It has been really a pleasure and an honor to have you here today and to hear about your experience and, and your, your experimental campaigns in microgravity. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was good to talk to you all.